What's up, man? Can you hear me? How's it going? It's going wonder. Hi, Edgar. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? Okay, so Edgar Palacio, are you a, a are you a Belizean? I am not Belizean, but uh, I am Nicaraguense. See, oh, the tons of Palacios in Belize. Is it really? Tons. Tons. Okay. What a pleasure to meet you. I'm Kathleen. Kathleen, nice to meet you. Are you Belizean? I am. My father is Belizean. Nice. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Central Americans, so. Well, <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> Randy, I'll turn on my camera when the time. The past few months, uh, this pandemic and obviously the tragedies that have happened during it, I'd like to acknowledge those with a brief minute of silence. Thank you all. Um, and uh, uh, we are uh, operating from across the country. Uh, we have a number of partners um, representing a few different regions, different states, different cities. Um, and uh, we are here to have a collective conversation about what comes after all of this. Um, from the lens of education for us, I think uh, unapologetically, every organization involved here today um, is uh, um, first thinking about our, our students. Um, I'm sure there are a number of parents uh, on the call here today. I think I can say unequivocally that we've all had a, a renewed um, appreciation for teachers and schools and what the education system provides us to be able to do as a, as a society. Um, both today and obviously in the future, especially for these young people. Um, so these are a handful of the folks. Um, I like to also, uh, so let me step back. I'm sorry. I want to introduce myself to those joining and those that don't know me. Uh, my name is Randy Saraguchi. I am the executive director of Urban Ed Academy. Uh, we're a nonprofit based in Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco. And we have a, uh, a very focused vision of recruiting enough black men into the city uh, to serve as elementary school teachers in our fellowship program, Manda Bay. And in order to make that a possibility, we are radically combining teacher recruitment with guaranteed teacher housing in the most expensive rental market in, this, in the country. Um, we have the pleasure of serving alongside uh, several partners, uh, Edgar, if you can, um, including uh, Mr. Edgar Palacios and the uh, Latinx Educators Collaborative. Um, we're very grateful for their support today on this virtual venue. Um, if we can go next slide, Edgar, on the uh, partners. Um, this is just a brief shot again of, of the folks uh, mentioned here. We have ourselves. Black to the Future is a collaborative in San Francisco of African-American-led organizations dedicated to the betterment and improvement of African-American families in the city. The Center for Educational uh, Opportunity at Albany State University, a proud research partner of ours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mon, uh, Dr. Mons and your team for all of the support you've given. The Surge Institute, uh, uh, Latinx Education Collaborative, uh, Innovare, uh, Social Impact Partners, and All Stars Helping Kids. Um, we're grateful for everybody's um, uh, time, energy, and efforts, uh, not just today, but throughout the year um, as we fight for the future of our students. 
just to get opened up. Uh, we have a, um, uh, a new partner in the Bay Area in Tyson Amir, and we found some very inspirational words uh, that we think are relevant for today. And thank you, Mr. Amir, for giving us permission to play this. Out. He was born out of wedlock, in and out of the arms of his pop who was in and out of trouble until he got shot. His mom's in between jobs, she in and out of relationships. He starts sliding in and out of the house quick. At school, lessons go in one ear, out the other. Outside his window, we sister watch the gangsters and hustlers jump in and out of new cars and new shoes. That cash go in and out of their pockets to keep them looking brand new. He's just a youth, easily influenced. So he's intrigued by these cats with no job, getting money without a degree. So he starts cutting classes, then he drops out of school. Now his hands are in and out of his pockets with rocks like them other dudes. He's a pawn in this game that's hard to break out. He hangs out on the block as this new scene plays out. The decision's laid out. It's either you in or you out. Without a doubt, he jumps in, scene one fade out. You see his mama, she out of his life now, cause he's living right now. She tells him to stop hustling, that's the same path. Yo, pop went down, he can't hear her, he blocks it out. Back on the block where them cops is out, they staking him out, cause now he's got clout. And undercover approaches to buy, he had a notion something was strange, but he ignored it because he out of his mind, he drunk and he high. Product and paper exchange, hands PD, jump out of three gray vans with guns drawn, he told, hands out your pockets, better keep them high. His mom's prophecy come true, ain't no escape in this time. He now property of the state and can't wait to get out. But on the outside, life don't wait. He finds out that his woman is late. Another born out of wedlock, away from the arms of his pop. is gonna spend the years of his son's life behind the doors of a cell block. When will this nonsense stop? Y'all gotta tell me when will this nonsense stop? His baby is getting older now, starting to crawl. You see youngster out in the yard, he playing basketball. You see him out by the three-point line, busting his J when no thought of changing his life when he get out some day. He can't seem to think outside of the box or outside of his block. He's preparing to spend his life in jail or outlined in chalk. Cause on them streets, you're always outnumbered and outgunned. Prison and death are the only logical outcomes, but he Way out of control, man, he in and out of the hole. Is he ever gonna figure it out and break out this outlaw Scarface complex? Meanwhile, the son is without a fault because he lives without a conscience. Cause it was underdeveloped, enveloped by these hellish streets. I just tell it how I see it. Some of y'all claim my words sound bleak. I would prefer if these stories never came out my mouth. But I gotta speak to this madness until my folks break out, break out. Again, thank you to uh, uh, Brother Amir uh, for permission to run that. Um, I, I was I was really inspired by the piece because I think you know the, the cadence was the first thing that I recognized on it, and it really is symbolic and emblematic of, of, of I think I think what a black man has to face. Um, it's just so many different. Uh, obstacles, barriers, circumstances, conditions that come our way. And um, um, I, I was, um, it speaks to how this is not a siloed issue in any place. And while again, we're talking about education, um, we know that solutions for what is a broken education system, solutions have to exist outside of the four walls of schools. Uh, and when we talk about um, social movements and we talk about change, there are two levers of social change, really. Uh, and I remember reading this from Saul Alinsky, and those two levers of power are people and money. And we know that the African American community has been disenfranchised for a long time, so the money side, let's park that. On the people side, we have us, and yet we know there have been barriers. And so we'd like to just get a, a, some, some uh, feedback from you all, everybody we have here today on this question. How do we get black men more involved in education as a support for our community? Uh, you, we have a couple of different options there and you wanna select other, um, uh, you can, but you know, is it to become a teacher? You know, I'm, you know, 
to, to spoiler alert, that's something I will vote for, um, is it to become a principal? We know uh, how special and powerful that position is. Is it to start a school and not necessarily be the leader, but uh, all of the work and uh, uh, grit and grind that it takes to put up a multi-million dollar business effectively in a school or support nonprofit organizations. There are plenty out there. Um, we'll give just a couple more seconds uh, before we show. Uh, what the responses are. I am heartened to see uh, my favorite ahead of the pack there, but it also shows that we have varying ideas and opinions about what our next steps are and ought to be, uh, because I think there's no question there are plenty of voice to fill across industry, across um, places. But we had to start at one place. Um, I think the power and position of uh, the leader of a classroom is, is, a, is a great place to be. Um, but again, I, I don't also want to ignore and, and uh, be ignorant to the fact that uh, there are many other factors involved. Um, and uh, here we go with the search results. Uh, appreciate you all giving uh, some feedback, some input here. Uh, hopefully we can convince uh, the rest of you all to, to pitch into this teacher bucket. Um, but uh, I've had the, I had the privilege in 2018 to uh, go through a fellowship uh, through uh, the Surge Institute, um, an organization that looks to accelerate leaders of color in education. And um, that acceleration does not just happen in districts, again, because there's so many facets to the solutions uh, we're, we're looking for. Um, uh, the Surge Institute was instrumental in giving me uh, more capacity as an individual leader um, uh, to be bold and step out and try to do some cool things uh, on behalf of our students and Urban Ed Academy and our work. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but um, it, there's an interesting, intricate web of, of leaders uh, of today and tomorrow in the Surge Institute that have a good pulse on what other systems leaders are talking about. And this notion of representation, I think, uh, has to be addressed. Um, in some education adjacent way, um, but also paying homage again to all of what we've seen. Uh, so the Surge Institute has been kind enough to host a, a brief lightning round conversation before we get started with the meat of, of our, of our today. And Edgar, if you can, next slide. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce this quick panel, uh, lightning round panel, two brothers that I know personally and in in the full gratitude of, of their work and their friendship. Uh, we have Mr. William Collins, uh, National Vice President of Development and International Affairs for the Surge Institute, and a, another recent Surge uh, Institute uh, fellow uh, alumni, uh, Nicholas Freeman, who is the President and Co-Founder of Innovare Social Innovation Partners. Um, I'll let them do a little introducing of themselves, but I, I wanted to reiterate, this is one of the cooler things I've done in pandemic, being able to connect like this. Uh, so thank both of you brothers for being here today. Can we uh, uh, go ahead and unmute? And I think just to kick this off, just for, just for you all, everybody's um, uh, sake, this lightning round is going to be a shorter round. Uh, we have two broader questions that we're going to be asking uh, here right now, one for Will and one for Nick. Um, and we're going to have more of a conversation than a, a flat um, question and answer session. This will be followed immediately by breakout groups where we'll have an opportunity for everyone to talk instead of a traditional Q&A, just to be able to keep the pace. Um, if that's cool, can y'all give me a thumbs up or something? Uh, but uh, um, in the meantime, I do want to give a chance, a quick minute uh, each for Will and Nick to introduce themselves. Why don't we go ahead and start with you, Will. Thank you, Randy. Uh, to everyone, hello again. Uh, my name is Will Collins, and as Randy said, I lead um, development and external affairs for the Surge Institute, and have been doing that for the past two years. Um, prior to that, uh, my start in education was actually as a classroom teacher, and I did that uh, for six years in the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, and it's truly the transformation that I was seeking to make. Um, across education started in the classroom. And so that's why I really thought it was important to be here today and to support uh, what's happening here. Um, 
during this session. So thank you. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, Randy, appreciate you for bringing us all together. It's always great to be in community, um, especially in these times where we can't be in that physical space. It's always great to engage in these virtual spaces. Uh, my name is Nick Freeman, co-founder and president with Innovera Social Innovation Partners. Um, here at Innovera, I, I lead our customer success team along with our strategic partnership work. Um, my background actually is not in education. I'm a private sector transplant. I come over from the financial world uh, where you know, I did the financial planning space, uh, but you know, didn't see the impact that I wanted to have. I uh, moved into education back in 2011 as a data strategist in the Chicago Public School School District. Uh, it's where I kind of learned the ins and outs of, of the systems of, of public schools. Um, since then, uh, with two of my other co-founders, one that was uh, recently at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the other at Google, uh, we co-founded Innovair, where we support our organizations around data, strategy, and project management. So excited to be here with everybody and excited for the conversation today. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, uh, okay, let's start with uh, uh, you, Will. Um, and I'm gonna pull my notes, I seem to do this right. Okay, the Surge Institute works to accelerate leaders of color in education, um, and it helps build representation across uh, public, private, and philanthropic sectors uh, for uh, our leaders of color. How will conversations about representation continue to evolve this year? Uh, what have you been hearing um, during these past few months, and, and what, what sort of insight um, do you have for the next six? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, so it's really a, a odd space to be in because the work that we do at Surge really book this fundamental belief that there won't be any transformation without representation. Um, it's kind of been our core and leading tenet um, as we've, if we've sought to do the work for the past five years um, as an institute across Chicago, Oakland, Kansas City, and now Indianapolis. And so the conversations that are happening across the country right now um, you know, while they are um, sort of being born out of, um, I would argue, a pandemic that's been happening for over 400 years, I think that uh, we're at a fever pitch right now and, and people are actually starting to sort of open their eyes and wake up to this idea that um, the black and brown brilliance that exists across the country um, needs to be uh, valued, needs to be elevated, um, and, and those folks that have the skill and the will um, that look like the students that we serve need to have positions um, across the education ecosystem um, in senior leadership roles that are at those decision making tables that are making um, those critical um, decisions on behalf of our babies. We believe that at Surge and we always have and so um, it, it's been so interesting to watch just this thing evolve over the past couple of months and um, the outreach that we've received from a number of places, both um, in the public and the private sectors, asking Surge to come in and, and, and really help them figure out how they can do more. Um, and, and so I think, you know, if folks are thinking about sort of what that next step is for them uh, in terms of getting involved in the movement um, at, the, at the local level, at the national level, I think one great place to do that is really within the four walls of a classroom. The impact that you can have um, on a group of students um, when they see someone who looks like them, who shares a background that they share, uh, who speaks the same language as they speak, to see someone that uh, in their classroom every single day do this work and lead in a way that represents their culture and their community Really, that is, that is the best way to honor what the ancestors have sort of laid out for us. And so at Surge, we just really believe that that type of transformation, that type of representation is really going to change the face of leadership in education unapologetically. Um, and we want to, and we encourage um, all of our Surge fellows and alums to really um, boldly acknowledge the strength that they have in their personal stories and honor the communities in which they come from to step up and serve. But we wanna make sure that if you're gonna step up and serve and take those senior leadership roles, we're gonna make sure you're ready to do that. Um, I definitely hold no punches when I'm uh, preaching my fandom and praise of Surge. Um, wholeheartedly agree, Will, and um, thank you. Um, 
uh, I guess I, I was going to say, we, we got to talk a little bit about the alumni experience a little bit. So that actually is a good segue to you, Nick. Um, before you talk a little bit about the work, if I ask about that, can you respond real quickly to, to Will, especially in the context of you coming off so fresh from the fellowship? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it speaks volumes, right? And I'll even take it even further is Innovare was founded on a capstone project of the Surge Institute, right? And, and really to be able to, you know, actualize that work through just our passion and, and being unapologetic about it, as Will mentioned, right? We, we are going to, or we're working towards, you know, that equity, right? But the, in, that we're never going to get there without our people driving, right? And we have to be unapologetic about that, right? Putting our people in the seats to make those decisions and seeing those decisions through. And really, you know, what the fellowship, you know, provided for me was really that ability to look inward and find out what my strengths and my powers and my, how I could bring my brilliance and excellence to the table without, without having to be perfect. Um, and, and really bringing that full rounded in, in, in the support and the community that was created for it or from it, um, it has been a huge supporter of, you know, not only my success in my career, but Innovare success and, and the community that surrounds us because of Surge. Right on. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Capstone Project because our, our organization is, is walking into uh, the next phase of, of, of our life off of a capstone project that I started here in Oakland as well. Um, and it just, you know, I, I think I can't speak enough uh, good things about um, that platform and that uh, uh, sort of training ground to have it all battle tested um, and, you know, ground, be grounded in understanding too that this is not going to be microwavable work. Like this is stuff that's going to take deep, deep commitment uh, likely over the rest of our lives. Um, so I hope I'm not scaring from the teacher candidates out there, uh, but this is lifelong work in case you didn't know. Uh, and our lives are going to look a whole lot different than our uh, ancestors for sure, but even our parents and our grandparents um, in, in 2020, uh, I think this, the age of information is really only getting started. Uh, we're seeing so much uh, happening with technology, all of the pivots we've needed to make post-COVID. Um, but I think specifically when we talk about our community, there is this, um, I think, um, uh, bridge or gap rather that needs to be bridged between how we command our data and how we um, utilize that to properly plan, strategize, and organize um, uh, at our organizational level or even great in greater society. And so Nick, you know, this is, this is your wheelhouse. Can you uh, talk a little bit about your work over at Interver, um, how you all empower leaders uh, to have a better command of that data? Um, but more importantly, um, can we talk about the lens of storytelling uh, uh, on top of all of this and what this means for us as an advocacy community? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I appreciate it because I mean, that is, you know, the work we're trying to do, right? Like, how do we equip our leaders who, by the way, are, you know, 70% women, 75% people of color that are leading organizations that are supporting our communities as well. But how do we equip them with not only the tools, but the confidence to really tell their impact story? As we know, in this space, we have, uh, we're, it's data overload, right? I always say we're, we're super data rich, but not so data savvy, right? So making sure that we're equipping them with the tools to get to insights rather than analysis, really in, in accelerating that process as we move into that strategy development as well, right? So when we're thinking through and, and not having to, you know, recreate the wheel, it also often, um, as I worked in Chicago public schools over the years, you know, we would go through these continuous improvement work plan processes, uh, but at times, you know, it lacked the collaboration amongst schools and other partners to share in the work that's actually happening and, and, and being impactful. Right. So and, and that's the last piece of our technology is, is really allowing us to facilitate and, and see the actual impact of the work that's being had. Uh, and I think that all leads to our ability to, to truly tell our stories, right, to tell that impact story and not just about the outcomes. Right. We need to know, like, what was it specifically that we did? Right. What were those key actions and those key primary and secondary drivers that we would leverage to really achieve those overall aims? Um, so for us, you know, it, it really is important for us to, you know, again, kind of drive the social innovation as well. Whereas we know, as, it, um, as you mentioned, Randy, on the kickoff, right, the solution isn't just going to come from the education space, right? It, it's really for us to bring partners to the table 
to solve common problems that exist across all of our social sectors, right? Whether it's education, housing, healthcare, all of those uh, necessities of our people to, to, to live and, and thrive and be successful, we need to be you know, co-designing solutions and sharing. Um, that's another piece that I, I, I've seen and experienced within you know, not only the, the school districts that we work with or nonprofits or social impact organizations, is just the, the, the closing out of that continuous improvement process, which is really packaging up our learning and then sharing it, right? Being sure that those insights and, and those successes or even failures, right, which could be as learning experiences can be shared with other communities. Because as you also mentioned, you, you were nailing it on the kickoff, Randy, like we exist within silos, right? And until we really break these silos down and begin to communicate and share around best practice and truly co-design in these solutions, we're gonna be taking a back seat to the true impact that what we could actually have. Um, and I think even more so than ever before now, I mean, we have the spotlight in this work, right? As, as Will just mentioned, folks are, are, are reaching out, trying to you know, learn and, 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 and provide those resources as, as it pertains to, the, to the, the money side, most specifically, I'll call it out. But now that we have the spotlight and now that we see the resources coming our way, we have to show the impact. Right. And again, that's the importance and, and the value that we try to bring to the table for all of our partners is, you know, providing that space to, to truly design, measure and tell the story of impact as, you know, we're really working to, you know, orchestrate this ecosystem, you know, to come together, to create co-design together and to truly have that lasting impact that we're, we're all intending to have for our communities to ensure that we are getting this, you know, racial equity and bringing the services and supports to our communities. Right on. Thank you, Nick. Um, and uh, before we transition out, uh, this is the lightning round. I appreciate you all um, uh, working with us here on this truncated um, uh, format. Uh, but we, we always have to defer to the elders. Uh, I'm not telling you his age. I mean, Serge Elder. Uh, but Will, you want to close us out real quick? Yes, sir. I'm, ha I'm honored to be called an elder. In this. <laughs> um, again, appreciate uh, having the time to come and speak with you all today. But I would just yeah, that pay attention to this moment. We're in a really critical moment right now where um, a lot of the things that we've been fighting for um, are, are, for whatever reason, um, starting to be uncovered and seen by a lot of folks. Um, and so I would just encourage people to remember that the assets that we need to really solve the problems that um, exist today and, and really elevate our spaces um, in the seats that we hold as black and brown folks across this country exists within the communities in which we serve. And so to remember that the communities have the assets that we need um, to, to take us to the next level. We don't, need to, we don't need to seek a bunch of outside opinions and perspectives. We already have what we need to really sort of take this thing and go on to the next level. And so pay attention closely to this moment and, and, and decide at this point whether or not you're ready to sort of join the fight um, in an official way. Um, actually, if you think about the black and brown babies across this country that need us, they need us in this moment. And so if you are toying with the idea of, of joining the education movement, I would encourage you to, to really say yes. I think the time is now. Okay, can we give some snaps and some uh, applause for both of our panelists here? Um, I appreciate you brothers, love you brothers. Uh, and uh, Edgar, can we go on to the next slide? Uh, so this is a mantra um, that our organization stands on and I'm sure everyone else is has heard here today, uh, but wanted to make sure we had it here as well. And this is uh, Mr. Frederick Douglass. It is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. Uh, and I want you to sit with that before we walk into these uh, breakout rooms. Um, but uh, before we do, I also want to share another uh, few words from um, another uh, legendary scholar, uh, Mr. James Baldwin. What is it you wanted me to reconcile myself to? I was born here almost 60 years ago. I'm not going to live another 60 years. You always told me it takes time. It's taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time, my nieces and my nephew's time, 
How much time do you want for your progress? How much time do you want? Uh, well, I Stop think we got some answers. And essentially, the country is so panic stricken about it. it. It means this. The generation of boys and girls who sing down those lunch counters are the first generation oh, of Negroes. Uh, uh, so how much time do we want? Our progress is going to rest with teachers. That is uh, where we're starting to take this general conversation and start to get it more specific. Um, and so another quick survey poll um, for you all. And that is this next slide here. How do we motivate more black men to choose teaching? Um, I, I, if it wasn't said earlier, less than 2% of the national teaching population are black men. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, but whatever they are, we know that black men are not there in those positions by and large. So while there's no, Right answer, one answer, what would you say um, is your top answer for what we can do to motivate more black men to choose teaching? Increase the teacher's salary, provide more employment benefits. I think we know a lot of teachers are not doing it for money. Um, do we start recruiting earlier? Do we get young brothers in high school, in the middle of college? Um, do we need more support along the way in the credentialing process? There are big barriers there if you have another. Uh, reason you think choose other and type it into the chat. Okay, I did not expect to see that as the answer, but um, it certainly is is a good one. Uh, there are plenty of programs. Um, call me Mr. Program out in Clemson uh, in South Carolina. Just trying to start pretty early. There's uh, a lot of good efforts going on in other regions. It's, it's, a, it's a smart move and it's one that hopefully locks in town for the long haul. Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's debate it a little bit. Let's talk about it. Uh, we're going to take, given our time, we're going to only take three minutes in our breakouts. Um, uh, Mr. Palacios has been so kind to uh, divide us up um, into uh, groups already. Um, for you, something else for you all to think about, if you put one black male in front of a black boy before sixth grade, he has a better shot at educational attainment. And that comes by way of a 29% increase in uh, applications and interest in college and a 39% decrease in dropout rate. Um, that was done by uh, some great work done by folks over the Urban Institute, American University, and UC Davis. Um, one more slide for us, Edgar. Um, before we go out, uh oh, you, uh, you guys got me on the first boo boo. Um, these are all placeholders, but um, these are just different frames and different systems for us to think about in terms of where those extra supports ought to come from. And so we'll have the first breakout room be around what universities can do. Uh, folks in that room, please talk about what you think colleges and universities ought to be doing in this. Second, local government, what are they doing? Is it is it more around uh, housing supports? Is it salaries? What can local government do to shift it? And then what the, can the community do? What can neighbors do? Folks that have free in-law units um, not being used, uh, houses that are sitting vacant, um, cars that are not being used that perhaps a teacher could use. You know, this is about creativity and about conversation. And so um, we're going to break out now. You'll have a designated uh, facilitator in uh, the room, and we'll just do it really quickly so we can get into our main panel. Okay, uh, I, excuse me. Uh, I just got a note from our facilitator that is not working. Uh, so I think actually, um, thank you all for your patience, uh, but I think we'll go ahead and just move through that. So we got a chance, we got the survey data that at the very least um, was good feedback. And um, I think we'll hear a whole lot more from our next few guests. I finally will shut up and let uh, um, other voices uh, uh, take hold here. And I'd like to introduce um, our uh, Deputy Director at Urban Ed Academy, uh, Mr. Daniel Rumley, 
uh, his brother has been working with me uh, for about seven years now. Um, so I'll let him introduce himself, our work, and also introduce our esteemed guests uh, to talk about um, this issue and whether or not it's a moment of strength for HBCUs. Good deal. I appreciate it, Randy. Um, in the spirit of, of, of brevity and, and, moving, and moving through and really hearing from the experts, um, real brief about myself, just been working with Randy for a while um, through Sacramento, through the South and different initiatives. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, been in the Bay uh, three plus years now, uh, really enjoying this journey of, of really trying to close some gaps um, that we feel like we can get it done here. It can really be done anywhere. But um, first off, Dr. Robert Simmons, um, Executive Director of Black Educators Initiative with Urban Teachers. Um, and I'll introduce uh, the good brother Casey in a minute. But I really wanna ask uh, Dr. Simmons real quick. Uh, you've got a body of work that kind of spans uh, over the course of two decades and really kind of understanding that people can't get lost in the in the sauce and the process of, of education without really knowing our history as a people. Um, I'd be really curious to hear what you think um, black men in their early 20s really need to be kind of thinking about that uh, are interested in education, maybe having an inkling um, about education and, and mm -hmm. speaking specifically. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, I want to thank uh, y'all for holding this space. I'm happy to uh, contribute. Um, yeah, it's been 20 years. It makes me feel old. Um, I think that one early career black male educators um, oftentimes uh, what I have learned, they want to change the world because they, they have, they believe and they know that education is a tool of liberation. So one of the things that I have found when I was an academic is um, a lot of brothers will walk into the school and the first thing they do is try to burn the whole joint down and they try to do it by themselves and they just walk into the room like this is Eurocentric curriculum. Why are we still teaching about Columbus Day? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And I'm not suggesting that they're wrong. All I always tell them is, but this is a marathon and like you got to do it with other people. And so one of the big pushes that I've had over my career with uh, in this space is that what's the training mechanism for us to work with young brothers who show up as teachers about how do you engage within the system? Mm -hmm. um, because if not, you're going to get fired, especially if you're in a situation where there's no union, right? And, a t and no teachers union, you're like you won't get due process. You'll just be out the door because you made the administrator uh, upset. And I think that part of it is um, the lost education of uh, Horace Tate, uh, Vanessa Siddle Walker's newest book, uh, looks at the history of black teachers um, as uh, social justice uh, activists and like all of these things, black educators in the work of Michelle Foster and all these other folks, they've done this before. I just think that we've, we've moved away um, in training teachers, getting them to understand the social foundations of our work as black educators. Um, and instead we've seen uh, a lot of programs, K-12, higher ed, et cetera, move directly into pedagogy. And certainly pedagogy is important, right? I don't wanna be dismissive of pedagogy, but the point of the matter is that as we structure these enterprises to help support early career black male educators, we have to give them the historical foundation to understand how to navigate white supremacy in school culture, but also pushing the boundary on our thinking around uh, the so-called school to prison pipeline. What I mean is that um, that's just one example of, of philosophically, is there a school to prison pipeline? Perhaps. I would argue that the more, the more dangerous thing is the nexus of school to prisons, where schools mirror prisons, right? Where you have a lot of these schools that have this no excuses thing going on. Brothers get in there and they think that 
young black children need to be educated by being more disciplined as opposed to being loved more, right? And so you'll have this thing where there are schools that have kids walking down straight lines, be four inches from the wall, walk with your hand behind your back, or they have quiet lunch, silent lunch. Like when I was eight, I wasn't going for silent lunch. I got a nine-year-old. My wife and I have a nine-year-old. He ain't going for silent lunch at nine. Right. He's turning all the way up, right? And, and the fact of the matter is, is that the socialization process of young folks at lunch, free from that like heavy-handed nature, um, and then as uh, some brothers mentioned in this research project I did uh, back in the day, it's this authoritarian piece of it, right? And so I think this historical piece uh, is really important. And last thing I'll say to that point is that we also need to work with them as they get older about being teacher leaders. Too much of our work focuses on and celebrating teacher uh, or administrators and, and what I would call is like the edulebrity culture, okay. right? And, and a lot of young brothers I've met, they aspire to go on TV. They aspire to be a school leader. And I'm not knocking it. All I'm saying is that we need to teach folks that, again, from my time being a school leader, I had plenty of friends that were terrible principals, but had good schools. Why? Because they had teacher leaders in their building. Right. But this principal knew where their gaps were, and they taught and worked with these young teachers to be teacher leaders so that they could lead the entire building from their classroom. So I think that we just have to reframe how we support them, but also reframe as elders in the space, how we allow them to bring voice to the space um, and not necessarily uh, look down on them uh, uh, for doing, you know, these random uh, things that don't make any sense because they're gonna make mistakes. Right. But, but I think again, you know, like I threw, a, I threw a kid's backpack down the hallway my third year of teaching. Cause I was so mad, right? And was like, man, you can get out. You don't know who I am. And was hot. Right. My principal, who was a brother, was a mentor, walked in my room and he said, let's take a walk together. He didn't write me up. He didn't blame me for the situation, but he coached me. Right. right? He loved me enough to say like, I ain't saying you wrong for being mad, but how else could you have handled that? But instead in many school cultures, we treat black teachers, black men and women, the same way we treat black children, where we suspend them, kick them out, and all these other things in the same way, right? And so I, I just think that it's important for those who are in leadership, the same way we love and nurture young people who are students, we also need to love and nurture young black educators um, in our uh, school spaces. Man, I really appreciate that uh, that answer. You going into your, your storehouse a little bit? Um, no problem. Absolutely. Uh, two quick references: things you said. Shout out to Nipsey Hussle. It's a marathon. Um, and shout yeah. out to um, dedication, Coach. hard work. Again, man. Yeah. But, yeah, but uh, uh, see, so you get me on my hip hop scene. No, right? no, no. <laughs> I did this paper uh, back in the day that was a study, um, and, I, and it's in an international journal, Critical Pedagogy, right? And it was a study of black men who used hip hop in schools. Man, the feedback that they received from their school leaders, and I always tell young brothers, do not walk into your school in your first day, quote Nipsey, talking uh, about the roads that grew from concrete until you understand the climate and culture of where you rest your feet. Because everybody ain't down for thinking about hip hop as a form of literacy. Some people no. think it's random ignorance, right? But I'm like, graffiti is, is literacy. Graffiti is art. Hip hop is literacy. Hip hop is art, right? So again, um, uh, shout out to all those hip hop heads uh, in, the, in the room. No, yeah, you, you, you're ringing bells for sure. Uh, no, that's a, you got to get you offline. There's, there's a, ton of, a ton of wisdom there. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's build. Um, I got to pull in Casey Bethel. Uh, Good brother, 2017 Georgia Teacher of the Year, 15-year um, educator. Um, and I'd really be curious in, um, Mr. Bethel, if you could, how would you advise um, HBCUs being uh, more prominent leaders in the education space? Um, and if you could weave that in a little bit with your own personal story of, of, of how you got drawn to the profession. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, can you give me a thumb if you can hear me? Can you hear me? 
Absolutely. Awesome. Hey, man, listen. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate so very much the opportunity to sit on this panel to soak up wisdom like I've been doing, but also uh, to share a little bit. Uh, my name is Casey Bethel. I've been 15 year educated, but um, my short, quick story, my introduction to education was uh, indirect. I didn't grow up wanting to be a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I had a career prior to teaching. Teaching is a second career for me. I spent some years, my mass, all my degrees are in science and in genetics, and I did research and then I came to teaching as a second career. And I mentioned that to say, um, I was one of the people on the, in, in the survey a minute ago that said, we, representation matters. Yes, we all, we're at this because we agree. And one of the ways we'll fill the gaps is by recruiting people, recruiting uh, young brothers to this profession earlier. Um, one of the things that struck me when I finally, I, I tried out teaching as a one year experiment, right? In between being a researcher and thinking about going back to medical school, I told my mom, I'm going to go teach for a year while I figure out what I really want to do. That's what, that's how I ended, landed in this. Uh, <laughs> but the light bulb went on in that one year that I came to realize that this is the thing that I was created to do. And I wish I'd been doing this the whole time. And I started to think back and reflect on, well, how did I miss it? Well, because nobody had ever pointed me towards being a teacher. All my years in school, I had never had anybody look at me and say, hey, why don't you think about being a teacher? We do, um, we do this profession a disservice. Now I won't say we, but our broader society does this uh, profession a disservice because we always point to the smartest kids in schools and we tell them, oh, you'd make a great lawyer. You'd make a great dentist. You'd make a great engineer. Don't you want to be a doctor? Don't, as if those are the, uh, right. we value some professions over others. Um, and whether or not we want to or not, we're giving kids the subliminal message that it's possible to be too smart mm. for teaching. Um, I'm, just, I'm just speaking open. I'm just speaking honest. Um, and so when I, when, when I came to teaching and I realized how much I loved it, I said, we got to change this and I got to be a part of changing it. And we need to. Uh, so now when I travel around the country and I speak to teachers, I tell them, pick some of the smartest kids in your school and tell them if, if you see the the dispositions in them, the, 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 the uh, communal sharing of information, the, the confidence to stand up in front of a group, those types of dispositions that would make a good teacher, then tell them you'd make a good teacher. Don't you want to think about it? And, and as we do that more, more young brothers will grow up thinking they want to be a teacher. And then we partner that with the second one, which is supports along the way, mm -hmm. um, getting them prepared for the classroom. And I want to, while we're talking about HBCUs, I just want to acknowledge that um, this has been a part of HBCU legacy in many, many places from the very beginning. I'm a graduate of Fort Valley State University, which began as a teaching college. In the history of this nation, so many uh, when, when nobody wanted to teach black kids, they had to have black teaching schools to train black teachers to teach black kids. And then in a lot of places, those institutions grew into HBCUs. That's a part of Fort Valley's history. And I bet a part of the history of a lot of HBCUs in this country this has been a part of our legacy from the beginning that we can't let slip, that we can't let go un, uh, unfulfilled, right? We need to maintain right. that. We need to celebrate that. And we need to continue that. Um, so no doubt HBCUs have access to the largest number of young mm -hmm. black men, young black sisters. Why shouldn't they be the places that are producing the largest numbers of young black teachers? And we need to do that, but it comes with being intentional. It comes with celebrating that as, a, as much as um, a successful college outcome as celebrating how many kids you get into medical school. How many kids you send to uh, the NFL through your D1 football program? We need to celebrate how many, how, many, how many teachers did FAMU produce this year? How many teachers did Claflin produce? How many teachers did Fort Valley produce? And celebrate that um, so that HBCUs will continue to, to, to live out their legacies. And then I just want to, um, my, my last statement to jump on to uh, something my brother Simmons said a minute ago, when we see uh, young black young black brothers who do make it through and become teachers in buildings, I, I want to try to save them from what happens so often. Um, one of the things that happens is that, that they, they're an underrepresented minority. It's usually only one or two of them. So uh, the administrators immediately tap them as the discipline chief of the school. 
as if that's what we're sent there to do, as if that's the only role we can fill. They bring all the bad kids to your room. You know what to do with them. They used to do that to me. Hey, Casey, why don't you deal with Rico? I'm like, well, that's not what I, I mean, I'm happy. I love Rico and I'm going to mentor Rico and I'm here for Rico, but I'm here to be the example of academic achievement as well. I'm here to teach kids science. Allow me to do that as much as you want me to just fill this needed role for you to discipline the kids that nobody knows how to understand. So stand up, be the model of academic excellence so the kids value intelligence that they see in you. Oh, if he's smart, then I can be smart too. And it's okay to be smart. It is okay to be smart. <laughs> clap, clap to that. Um, Brother Simmons, if you could, and, and you, uh, uh, Mr. Bethel, quick 20, 30 seconds parting words um, to just, you know, what you want to leave people thinking about as we want to elevate and continue to elevate the, yeah. profession. Uh, support black men who want to go into uh, education um, by making sure that we provide them with access to the financial resources um, and the platform to actually pursue it and the support uh, to pass all the credentialing. I agree. Um, recruit young brothers earlier, uh, help them to see education as a, as a positive outcome, as something to be celebrated. Sure. Man, I appreciate you, brothers. Thank you for your time, um, your work in the space. Um, and, and, and until next time, Randy, um, on to you, my good brother. Salute, man. Salute to both of those brothers. Thank you, Dr. Simmons and, and Mr. Bethel. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Rumley, uh, for holding us down. Um, I mentioned at the, at the top of, of the program that we have a research partner in the Center of Educational Opportunity, Albany State University. Um, and being respectful of everyone's time, uh, we are doing great. Uh, but I wanted to give um, Dr. Mons and her team a chance uh, to talk a little bit about uh, research that is actively happening from their shop on African-American male teachers. Thank you, Randy, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone on the call. Uh, I'm Kathleen Mons, the founding director for the Center for Education Opportunity. I know that time is of the essence. And so there are two, uh, I, I actually yield to Dr. Erica, Erica DeQueer, who's gonna speak a little bit first about HBCU's role in graduating teachers of color. But I did wanna take a moment to, to just share that our center was founded in 2018. And we certainly serve, and Dr. Simmons just mentioned, we really serve as a way to provide some of that financial support and particularly to teacher leaders as well as researchers that are doing great work. And so Dr. DeQueer, I'm gonna to yield to you and then I'll follow back up with a little bit of conversation, a little bit more about the work that we're doing and direct, directly within our center. And thank you again for the invitation. Sure, and thank you, Dr. Mons, and as well for the invitation. Uh, we are so very um, fortunate to be a part of this very important conversation. And I am Dr. DeQueer. I'm an associate professor at Albany State University, which is in uh, HBCU in Southwest Georgia. And I also work as the fellow with the Center for Educational Opportunity along with Dr. Mons. And one of the things that I wanna do is just paint this educational landscape for you all and drill in the urgency of what we are facing. In about two decades, half of public school students will be students of color. Yet 80% of those who are teachers in these public schools will be white. And in fact, if we look just at elementary school, 87% of our elementary school teachers are white and female. So most of our students are in classrooms where they do not see or have that African-American male role model as both an example of academic excellence and one who can be what we call a warm demander, someone who can be warm yet maintain a strong discipline environment for our students to thrive. When we think about HBCUs, they began as teacher training institutions. That is our legacy, as was mentioned earlier. And as we consider HBCUs moving forward, there are some important advantages that HBCUs offer. One is making sure that we are able to um, identify and be able to produce large number of students and future teachers who will be able to diversify the teacher pipeline. That is something that we do 
at HBCUs that we are gathering in a lot of strength and getting a lot of support from around the country as we fulfill that particular need. One of the things that we offer, of course, is we offer culturally relevant practices, not just in teaching our own students, but also in training our teachers in order to work with others. So we offer culturally relevant teaching practices, culturally diverse school contexts, trusted and accredited programs, and of course, affordability and access. One of the things that has been a hallmark of HBCUs is that we have some very strong and dedicated faculty who can work and assist these students who are preparing to be future teachers. But all of that aside, I want to really uh, just kind of clue you guys in on a secret, and that is it's not the, um, I would say, factors in recruitment. It's not factors in recruitment, and it's not even when we look at finances. It's what we see in the credentialing process that is creating the barriers for so many African-American males and all students of color to enter the teaching profession. And historically, there's a ton of data that shows that we begin to see a drop in African-American teachers and teachers of color right as the civil rights movement was winding down and there was a host of different regulations and policies. So policies and regulations have do, done much more in order to reduce the number of black and brown teachers and black and brown male teachers in the classroom than any of those other factors that were mentioned. So I really implore that you all take a look at not just HBCUs and for its strengths moving forward, but you can also work as advocates in order to reduce some of the policies and some of the regulations that keep many uh, willing and able and very competent uh, teachers of color uh, from the classroom. Thank you, Dr. DeQueer. And what I'll do is I'll finish up with a few comments regarding the work that we're doing within our center. And as I shared a moment ago, we launched our center in 2018. Uh, we are funded a five-year grant by the Thurgood Marshall College Fund to really serve as a, a, a point guard, if you will, on educational research. And certainly, again, I applaud the work of Dr. Simmons. But we know in the research landscape around African-American male teachers, there uh, are the likes of the Ivory Tolson as well as the, uh, the Gloria Latson Billings and the great work that they're doing. And so one of the things I'd like to kind of share with your audience, particularly the students who are pre-service teachers or even those who are in service, is that we recognize that, and I think Dr. Uh, Simmons mentioned it earlier, is this important, this important role that teachers play while in the classroom. And Casey Bethel did not mention, but he's actually also one of our teacher leaders. We provide uh, financial support for him to work on a white paper that came uh, that was published through our center and Casey Bethel along with some other African American teachers along with the likes of Abdul Wright who's a teacher in Minnesota as well as Kareem Neal who's an African American male teacher in Arizona is that what we understand and we agree with the work that you've already stated is the important role that teachers play within the classroom and we also understand that when we look up when we think about a uh, voice and, uh, and, and the work of increasing the number of African-American male teachers, we think through three lenses, the lens of both teachers, the lens of advocates, as Dr. DeQueer mentioned, and certainly the lens of researchers. And then what we'll do is, uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, finally, in closing, I wanna share also the Thurgood Marshall College Fund has a program entitled the Teacher Quality and Retention Program that also provides additional support for those teachers who are in the field so that they can continue their efforts. And so we look forward to continue the partnership. And again, thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Mons. Thank you, Dr. DeQueer. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and as we close, I uh, just want to have a graphic here of some um, abstract city in the future. What, are our children going to be ready for that? Um, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. So you know, you've seen th these pictures before. Are they going to be ready for this? Uh, is not necessarily just a question that our education system is going to answer, but it's one we should keep in mind. There is a world ahead of us um, that we got a whole lot of preparing to do for, and we think that starts in schools. Um, so what can we do together? 
Um, we have two very simple call to actions. Um, in, uh, next slide. Teach, if you're a black man, you're uh, of age and of the passion and interest and determination to do it, we need you to teach. And if you are not a black man to do that, uh, we would ask you to ask a black man to teach. Uh, hopefully everyone on this call knows at least one. And um, to the degree that you do, let's start a conversation and get it going. Um, thank you everyone, uh, all of our partners, all of our speakers, all of our attendees for spending a little bit more time with us with four minutes over. But with one more minute um, uh, as we opened, I would like to close with brother uh, Tyson uh, Mir and give him uh, the last word here uh, as an educator, activist, and poet. Appreciate that. Greetings, everyone. Uh, really am grateful for the opportunity to be here because this is such important work and also for this, this brief moment right here. So as the call to action is, teach, ask a Black man to teach. In addition to that, we all have a role to play. So maybe we're not going to be the one teaching. Maybe we don't know anybody to ask, but there might be something else that we can also contribute, which is I mean, whatever our skills, our resources are that we have on deck, being able to utilize those and prioritize those for this cause. Maybe some of y'all are going to be curriculum designers and we need that. Uh, I am an author of the book Black Boy Poems, also the author of the Black Boy Poems curriculum. So whatever type of programming, maybe it's a financial contribution, whatever we can do to forward this movement. And then also thinking about and strategizing how we can harness the power of those resources to also build our independent institutions. We got to navigate, navigate this existing education institution. And so having more black bodies in there, black brothers, sisters, our black folks in there, but then also thinking about what we can build on the side of that to use that as power and influence to leverage against that existing institution, but then what we can have and operate independently that we control. But this is our, this is our task and it's a beautiful task to have in front of us. Let's do it together because we are definitely going to be stronger together. And as a, uh, our revolutionary ancestors from the Bay area would say power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, That's a beautiful way to close, sir. And uh, I hope everybody is taking something away from this. We're looking forward to staying in touch. You all will receive an email from us with um, uh, contact information uh, of, of anybody you want to get in touch with after this. Um, any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll also have folks try to answer those. But uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay kind. Have a great rest of the week.